Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the U.S. Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland. I'm Jeff McCreese. I'm the Deputy Director of the James Stockdale Center for Ethical Leadership. And this is another installment in our series entitled Brain Science and Effective Leadership, uh, made possible by the generous support of the Robert and Mary Looker Foundation. Uh, today's program is being recorded and will be placed on the Stockdale Center's website. So today we're honored to have speak uh, Professor James Giordano from Georgetown University, whose talk is entitled Battleship, a Battlescape Brain, Leading and Leadership in Preparedness and Use of Neurocognitive Science in Military and Intelligence Operations. Uh, after Dr. Giordano's uh, prepare comments, he'll entertain questions and comments. Uh, please submit them via the chat function of Google Meets and uh, I will acknowledge you after his prepared comments. And we'd ask that you please uh, keep your microphones on mute for the entirety of the presentation, unless you've been acknowledged. Uh, a few notes about uh, Professor Giordano's distinguished uh, career. Uh, he's a professor in the Department of Neurology at Georgetown and a professor as well in uh, Georgetown's Department of Biochemistry. Uh, he leads a subprogram in military medical ethics of the Pellegrino Center for Clinical Bioethics. Uh, he is fellow of the Project on Biosecurity, Technology, and Ethics at the U.S. Naval War College in Newport, uh, and is the author of over 300 publications, seven books, 20 government white papers on neurotechnology, biosecurity, and ethics. And of, uh, of interest to many of you on this call, he also wore the uniform of a U.S. Navy officer earlier in his career. So, gee, as I turn this over to you, I might ask you maybe to say a couple of minutes about that last point and tell us a little bit about your time in uniform, and we welcome you to the uh, U.S. Naval Academy. Pete, over to you. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure and honor to be here. Well, this I was in uniform a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. I got out of the military in 1995, but obviously my ongoing work since then has continued to conjoin military and civilian units, both within our government and internationally with our, our allies. I was a United States Naval officer, Naval Aerospace Physiologist, uh, held additional designations as a research physiologist and research psychologist. And I was the director of the Aerospace Training Center at Marine Corps Air Station Cherry Point. I was involved with operational engineering and test flight directorate there at Cherry Point, primarily working as the aeromedical liaison to operational training and readiness for ComCab East, the, the Marine Corps stations on the East Coast. That involved not only the fixed wing community, but certainly the rotary wing community as well. My main areas of interest were aeromedical and biomedical fitness and capability for what we were calling at that time the aerospace athlete. The training environments, not only of aerospace, but certainly of underwater and special operations were just as demanding, if not more demanding, than a professional athlete with the caveat that characteristically on the playing field of any sort, nobody's shooting at you. So I had the pleasure of doing all of my operational flight time with the United States Marine Corps. And I shout out a healthy Semper Fi to all my Marine colleagues and a belated happy birthday. And I served as the aeromedical liaison to the station operation engineering squadron there at Cherry Point, as well as to VMAQ-2 and then later on to the MAG. And my particular areas of expertise at that time and operational designations and, and facilitation was in G tolerance with high performance aircraft in the, in the turn and burn fast mover community, high altitude work, both with our folks who are in the rotary wing community who were doing some high altitude training at that time in preparation for utilizing what ultimately became the V-22 Osprey, and then also biomedical fitness and performance programs uh, throughout not only the, the air medical community, but more broadly through some of the more special operations in the United States Marines. That was my time in uniform. That said, one of the things that we've come to understand, and it, it, it predicates on some of the, the work earlier, is that we're clearly at a point where we see a critical interface between the engineering and the human in the loop. And very often, the human in that loop, irrespective of whatever that loop may be, whether it's aerospace, which certainly is my sandbox, undersea, special operations, and a variety of different capabilities and taskers, is characteristically at a point of somewhat becoming overwhelmed by science and technology that's being put in place so as to make the job easier, but also to make mission effectiveness more viable. Increasingly, what we're looking to do is try to figure out how the neurocognitive systems, in other words, how that thing in your head is important to be able to then drive the thoughts, emotions, and actions that produce good leadership, number one, and number two, what it's going to take to lead 
ever more in an international community in which the actual battlescape, in the words of the field of engagement, is the brain and its functions vis-a-vis -vis the mind. My ongoing work over the past 20 years has had the generous support of a number of different institutions, organizations, as well as the federal government, and I acknowledge each and all of them here. As well, I think it's important to understand that what I'm presenting to you here represents my work. It doesn't necessarily reflect the views or perspectives or opinions of those organizations and institutions that have provided their generous funding, nor does it provide those perspectives necessarily of the United States Department of Defense, the Intelligence Community Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, or the Naval War College. That said, let's start a deep dive. And let me take you through this step by step because I think it'll become ever more important, not only for what I'm presenting here today, but if in fact we're going to open the lens and examine if and how the brain sciences can be used to affect viably good performance, good leadership, and also what leadership means increasingly in a global stage that's built upon a heightened understanding and capability to access and affect the brain. Uh, simply put, the mere fact that you can hear me right now means your brain is working. But I'm not talking to a bunch of quivering brains. I'm talking to brains that are embodied in individuals or embedded and nested within a variety of different ecologies. Their, their environments, professional environments, cultural environments, demanding environments. What the field of neuroscience and its incumbent techniques and technologies, what is colloquially referred to as neuro s &T, have done is they've essentially put the brain at our fingertips. They've given us the capability to harness and engage a variety of different convergent scientific and technological tools and methods to be able to study, access, and affect human thought, emotions, and behaviors, inclusive of those that are intrinsic and fundamental to leadership and to performance in military intelligence and warfighter environments. The capability to do this is certainly applicable across a broad range of use patterns and use communities within the military. And I hope to illustrate some of those. But more and more, our understanding is that the lines that we draw between them are what have been referred to as fuzzy boundaries. What constitutes medicine? What constitutes engagement? What constitutes training? What constitutes treatment? What constitutes enhancement? And how far do we go? Furthermore, the ability to utilize the brain sciences and its technologies allows us the capability to affect human activities and assess human activities across a variety of levels, individually, groups, teams, perhaps even entire populations. And, and big data ever more is becoming a force multiplier and vital tool that allows those assessments and real-time access to multi-levels of massive data that not only enable what the brain sciences are capable of doing, but also enable its translation to a variety of use scenarios. And what are those use scenarios? Well, let's play connect the dots. If I can assess what's going on in that gray stuff in your head to be able to produce the great stuff of your thoughts, your emotions, and your behaviors, well, then clearly I've gained some insight into what's making you tick on the level that goes all the way from the cells to the social, from the personal to the political. And if, if I can go one step further, I can use those assessments, if you will, as something of a reconnaissance mission. Then the question here is, what am I reconnoitering? Well, I'll tell you what I'm reconnoitering. I'm reconnoitering possible targets for interaction on a range of levels, from the non-invasive, low-tech, to the highly invasive, high-tech, but not necessarily invasive in a surgical way, invasive in a penetrant way, in a ubiquitous way that allows us to get into the brain without utilizing the grossly invasive techniques of surgery by harnessing other techniques and technologies such as nanotechnology, various aspects of guided electromagnetic current and displacement that then allows us to influence the brain on a range of different levels, certainly through machine computational and brain interfacing, but ever more through the use of electromagnetics, onboard clouding, Satellite technology, the very same thing that operates your cell phone, is providing us not only windows to the brain, but vectors to the brain that allow us to read information in real time from brain nodes, networks, circuits, whole brain systems remotely, and also to remotely affect those brains. More on that in a moment. What this represents is a rising tide. Obviously, I'm talking to a group of naval officers, so the idea of understanding the tides is very, very important to understand how you navigate here, too. 
Back in 2008, the National Academies of Science and the National Research Council took a look at brain science viability and what we call NSID, National Security Intelligence and Defense Agendas, and deemed at that time, although the science was certainly valid, certainly it represented a positively valent trend in where it was going and how it was going there, they, they determined that it wasn't quite ready for prime time within military operations due to issues of tech readiness, scalability, and fieldability. I had the honor and pleasure of participating at least in part of that report. And I must tell you that I and several others didn't agree with that conclusion in, in some. Yeah, perhaps there were parts of it that were clearly relevant and correct, but the entirety of it didn't give a good flavor, if you will, for the rising tide and the wave of brain sciences that were occurring not only in the United States and with our international allies, but worldwide with our peer competitors and potential adversaries. A number of reports in the interim, some of the work we had done, for example, at the Strategic Multilayer Assessment Group, the Joint Staff of the Pentagon, and had the great pleasure of working with Doc Kabayan, now working with former Captain Todd Vesey, United States Navy Special Operations SEAL, also with Dr. Diane Deulis, Dr. Jason Spitaletter, Dr. Bill Kaysbeer, Dr. Nicholas Wright, all of our colleagues back in the early part of the, the 2000s, from 2006, 7, 8, up through 2010, leading up to the National Academies report, kept our finger on the pulse of the brain sciences, both intramurally within the sciences and extramurally in terms of what was going on in the social community of how brain sciences are being utilized for military intelligence and political agendas. Our reports from 2009 through 2012 suggested a very, very different capability, possibility, and probability that indeed the brain sciences were being harnessed, had high utility, and as a result, that value was a driver in increasing their consideration and in some cases, context for their use within various militaries worldwide. We weren't alone in that. The Nuffield Council report in 2013 validated that and rose some of the ethical issues that might be important to understand what that now means, being able to affect the brain in those ways that are viable not only for the training and performance of one's own military and intelligence personnel, but how that might be leveraged to gain purchase over the capabilities, thoughts, and behaviors of what might be hostile or adversary or competitive personnel. Well, the nice part about the National Academies is they're certainly flexible. In 2014, they reconvened, and the National Academies report came to the conclusion that some of these other groups I just mentioned also did, that their initial scope was not broad enough or deep enough to actually capture the momentum, the, the juggernaut effect of what the neurosciences were becoming, not only nationally, but internationally. It didn't actually capture, if you will, the pendulum swing, the speed, the depth, the extent of that progression to tech readiness levels that would then allow military readiness levels. By 2014, the remanded report stated that there was increasing research, development, test, evaluation, use, RDT, and U, of brain sciences for consideration to military and intelligence operations and directly for military operations. Now, obviously, the United States and our international allies, most notably our, our NATO, as with, eight, with NATO, engage in brain scientific research and orientations towards its translation in military and or potential intelligence political context in accordance with dual use research of concern, biological toxin weapons and chemical weapons conventions. However, that also establishes something of a dilemma. Well, that certainly fortifies and creates parameters, if not constraints for participatory states conduct in the United States, its allies that are signatory to these treaties and these conventions. What it essentially does is also declare aloud, if you will, what we will not do. And the caveat here is that not every nation signs those treaties, not every nation that signs those treaties ratifies those treaties, but more than that, and somewhat more benignly, the cultures, the histories, the needs, the values, and the political and economic infrastructure of other nations is not identical to that which we have here in the United States. And in many cases, those differences in infrastructure and infrafunction on a variety of levels, from the political all the way to the populational, from the academic all the way to the applied, provide something of a leg up, if you will, to be able to expand what's capable in research and its translation directly as well as duly into military operations. So what are those domains of military use of brain science and its technologies? Well, clearly military medicine is one. 
and we could argue, as I do often, that that's the low-hanging fruit. I mean, many of the very exciting agendas that were funded through the BRAIN Initiative, the Brain Research to Advancing Innovative Neurotechnologies Initiative in 2013, were dedicated in first-year allocation to DARPA, the Department of Defense's Advanced Research Project Agency. Why? For applications within military medicine being sensitive and in this way responsive to the burden of the human predicament that's been incurred through long-standing conflicts overseas and the nature of our wounded warriors and personnel who come home with a variety of neurological and neuropsychiatric conditions that heretofore have been problematic to diagnose and treat. So of course, military medicine with, with the lowest hanging of the low hanging fruit being neurology, neurosurgery, psychiatry, pain medicine, and rehabilitative medicine. Absolutely true. However, let me throw something out there to you. How would we define military occupational medicine? And if we go one step further, how would we define and operationalize the scope and conduct and toolkit of preventive occupational medicine for the military? Now what we're talking about is doing certain things to our operators, our, our sailors, our soldiers, our airmen, our Marines, that enable them to have a preventive edge in those areas of their professional occupation, whether it's trigger pullers, truck drivers, deck pounders, that afford them the capability to remain healthy on the job and therefore missionally ready on the job, to be protected in a range of their occupational and operational skill sets, environments, ecologies, and stressors, and in some cases, to maximize their capability and performance, clearly what occupational medicine is designed to do. But what does that actually obtain and entail? Well, if we take a look at the neurocognitive sciences, the issue there is, well, what we need to do is keep it healthy and buff it up. Well, is that treatment? There's nothing wrong with these people, per se. I mean, let's face it, not getting an A on every exam doesn't render you pathologically stupid. It simply means that you're somewhere along the viable human performance curve. But what if we were looking to maximize that curve? What if we were looking to, in fact, steepen the curve, increase the slope, and move those personnel who we acquire within our military services and intelligence communities a little closer to the mean or perhaps shift that mean rightward and, as a result, shift everything rightward? And in this way, we could facilitate selection, training and education, sustainability, force readiness. Well, what is that? Is that training or is that enhancement? And the question is both rhetorical and practical. Because if we can use it in these ways, in occupational and preventive military medicine, the orientation here is to keep our people as good as they can possibly be. Good, gooder, goodest, if you will. Super sailors, super soldiers, super spooks. And what might we be able to do to enhance, for example, intelligence accommodative assets, making them more accommodative to provide us the information we need? And I venture into that latter domain simply because that's a prime consideration for some of our international peer competitors. But once I begin to think about how I can utilize any form of science and technology to contend against others, I recognize that I'm dealing with a dual-sided blade. One side of the blade is what can I do to my own people to make them better? And in some cases, there may be ethical prohibitions, prescriptions, various improbities that exist on a variety of levels from the civilian all the way to the professional, from the professional all the way up to the political. And certainly we deal with them. Uh, here in the United States and among our allies, we want to fight for right and freedom while keeping our honor clean. And in some cases, keeping our honor clean means that are going to be certain constraints and proscriptions, what it is that we might be able to do or we even consider doing. But let's harken back to my earlier statement. Keeping honor clean is relative based upon how one defines goods and honor and what one can do in the context of military intelligence to be able to lessen the escalation to combat, to war, to make military intelligence personnel more effective and or to decrement the capability of peer adversaries and competitors to want to fight, to engage the fight, or to be capable in those things that lead to the battlescape. As soon as we talk about contending against others, that's a formalized definition of a weapon. So clearly what we see is that the extant ethical foci, 
those things that we're concerned about ethically, if we're looking at how are we going to lead not only military medicine, but also those who are the responsible subjects of military medicine, in other words, our personnel, how do we deal with that? Well, if we're just dealing in clinical issues, this is much of what we deal with in DMEC, the Defense Medical Ethics Center, of which I have the honor and privilege of serving with my colleagues, Josh Gurton, Alexany Coombs, Joe Procaccino, Colonel Fred Lau, and Megan Applewhite. And our role there is to appreciate, engage, respond to, and be sensitive to the unique ethical issues that arise in military medicine. Many of them are similar to civilian medicine, but some of them aren't because of the collective nature of the military and the need for force preservation. But immediately, as soon as we talk about force preservation, we talk about performance optimization, readiness of force, maximization of capability. And now we're into the whole area once again of what are the ethical issues and technical issues of how far we might be able to take the brain sciences to make our people better, particularly in ways that affect their cognitive and motor performances. And then the issue comes, well, if we're drawing a line about what things we can do to our own, might we then consider about what we might do to others? Or perhaps in a reactive and reflective stance, what might our peer competitors, cum adversaries, be doing to their own that we would then need to at least be prepared, if not responsive, to deal with on a leadership level that runs all the way from the non-kinetic to the fully kinetic? And this then clearly brings us into a unique realm. This creates the brain as a viable battlescape, a battlescape in terms of the performance of our own personnel engaging in those activities that are intrinsic and inherent to their military and intelligence missions, and also the way we engage with others on that battlescape who are competitive, who are in conflict, and who are adversaries. And as soon as we begin to realize that we can do to our own, we can also do certain things in contrast to others to decrement their performance while in fact getting force advantage to ourselves, you get down to the simple equation of pre-bellicosity and bellicosity. I mean, you're looking for advantage on your side. You're looking to exploit disadvantage or to create disadvantage on the other side so as to maintain a balance of power and either do that through a show of force or perhaps actually engagement of force. This is a weapon. But here we have to be very, very specific in our definition of what constitutes a weapon. I harken back here to the Oxford English Dictionary. A weapon is nothing more than means of contending against others. It need not be violent. It need not be destructive. But by definition, it's going to be disruptive. Disruptive, if in no other way, than by diverting their original intent towards malice and harm into an intent that mitigates or prevents said malice and said harm. It's a phrase that had been repeated multiple times by Lincoln, quoting the Buddha. If I can take my enemy and make them my friend, ergo, I have an enemy no longer. But what about that? What if I can not just affect hearts and minds, but what if I can affect minds to change hearts and spirits and actions? What if I can mitigate aggression, foster thoughts of feelings of affiliation and passivity in those individuals who my competitors come adversaries? You know, what if I can make a happy battlescape, a happy smiley place where everybody's holding hands and wants to sing Kumbaya? Is there something wrong with that? Is that perhaps in some way more acceptable than utilizing neuroscience and technology as a more frank hard weapon, bombs, bullets, tanks, and ships? But certainly we have to also consider that the brain sciences can be leveraged in those ways as hard weaponology. And here we're talking about drugs, bugs, toxins, and devices. If we take a look at the age of weaponology, what we see is almost a vertical slope as we move to the 20th century. Why? Because if we look at the 18th and 19th centuries as the century of massive scientific development, inclusive of governmental initiation, support, and agendizement of science and technology, by the time we get to the 20th century, arguably that is the century of tech, the century of tools, of mechanized warfare on a large scale. But it's the mechanization of that warfare that becomes ever more important to consider because that mechanization need not just be bigger. It's not just a question of getting a bigger aircraft carrier or a bigger submarine or a bigger capable multi-engine jet aircraft. It's better. But where does the better lie? Does the better lie in the machinery, the widgets, if you will? Or as so many of our military leaders have advocated over the past decades, that the actual capability of the force is intrinsic to its people. 
forces a focus of the lens on those individuals themselves, if nothing else, to make them more compatible and more capable with the advanced technologies that we're providing to them on a variety of scales, from things that are manned to things that are unmanned, to things that involve literally moving levers to those things that involve large scale use of cloud computational systems. So if we take a look at the way the brain sciences can be leveraged in those ways, yeah, we can buff our own people up, but there are also plenty of things we can use to decrement the performance of others on a variety of scales from the cellular all the way to the social political. I think we're most familiar with weapons being somewhat hard weapons, in other words, physical influence and deterrence tools. And again, when we're talking about the brain sciences, like any one of the biochemical sciences here, we're talking about drugs, chemicals, and a variety of agents, biologicals, bugs, microbes, and toxins, and devices, and increasingly data, biodata. Working with my colleagues, Dr. Diane Deulis and Charles Lutz at the National Defense University, we've taken a real healthy look at the need for increasing biodata security, bio cyber security, and the purloinability of these data that are available, for example, in individuals' personnel jackets, their medical records, and increasingly their interaction with commercial entities that are saying, well, let's, let me just take some of your genome so we can see what your family history is like. Well, the question there is who owns those data? Where do those data go? How might we be able to use those data? Working with our research affiliate, uh, our research associate, Joe DeFranco, one of the things we pointed to is that neurodata can be particularly vulnerable. Why? Because so much of what is neurocognitive is not objective, where we can say, well, here's something that goes bang in your brain, but rather the bumps and the bangs in your brains are manifest in things like your thoughts, emotions, and behaviors. And you know as well as I do that any manipulation of that data, any purloinment of that data can be used in a variety of ways. One way is to simply insert or delete certain things in a medical file that deal with somebody's neurocognitive fitness. Boom, there goes their clearance. Boom, there goes their fitness for duty. Boom, there goes their overall capability. And more than that, they're being treated and regarded in a particular way based upon that diagnosis. There's nothing wrong with them. It says so on paper, it says so in their record. But let's go one step further. Could I also use that information to create precision pathologies? The more I know about you, the more it can affect you. I'm not about to start singing show tunes, getting to know you, but hey, getting to know you, getting to know all about you, getting to like you and hoping that you like me. And if you don't, I can fix that. I can get into your brain through either narratives and information or perhaps even directly in some way or another, and I can affect your stance, your posture, your thoughts, your emotions, and your behaviors. No science fiction, folks. This is science fact. Now, I can do that in ways that are soft leveraging, or I can use economic leverage. This gets back to what's called the golden rule. Who has all the gold rules? And increasingly, what we see on the world stage is that the United States and its allies are losing a bit of traction here, that by expression and intent, our trans-Pacific competitors are gaining a major foothold in science and technology through a variety of applications in their four-year plans, such that by the year 2035, with an eye on 2049, they're looking for global hegemony in many spaces inclusive of the neurosciences and technologies. <laughs> Let's think here. You're dealing with a country that has a seamless triple helix of government, research, and commercialization. Direct uptake into military and intelligence operations is a given. More than that, however, this is 175 billion currency units a year in viable economic leverage. I come to any bargaining table and I'm creating a maximum share. Suddenly I have cred and clout, but not just there. What I'm also able to do is to attract individuals into my country to do research, to do certain things in my country, even on the medical side that I can then promulgate worldwide. And that creates dependencies dependencies not only among developed peer competitor nations, but also dependencies and interreliances upon developing and developed nations for a variety of different hegemonic and power balance disruptions. I can certainly also use the brain sciences for intelligence and psychological operations. A case in point here, some of the work that we're doing with our colleague at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory, Dr. Jason Spitaletta, who's looking very closely at how neural basis of cognitive function can affect individuals and groups which harkens back to an older project that was initiated by our colleague, Dr. Bill Casebeer, when he was still at DARPA, called Narrative Networks. And I had the pleasure of working with Bill on the neural narratives component of that. 
the more I understand how somebody's brain works, what makes them jolly, what makes them not so jolly, what jousts them, what makes them sad, what makes them upset, what triggers their volatility and vulnerability to violence, the more I may be able to utilize a variety of stimuli, implicit as well as explicit, to change their feelings. And in changing their feelings, I can change their behaviors. So if we're going to use neuroscience and technology in national security, intelligence, and defense agendas and operations, what am I doing with it? Well, essentially, we're engaging what are sometimes referred to as the three A's, assess, access, and effect. But I want to be more specific in this context. We're talking about affecting the brain. We're talking about targeting the brain, targeting the brain to target individuals, targeting individuals on our end to make them better, targeting individuals who may be competitors, come adversaries, so as to then decrement certain aspects of their thought, emotions, and behaviors, so as to create a tech readiness, military advantage on our side. And if I can target key nodes and networks in the brain, I may be able to do so in ways that are not explicitly injurious to the outside of that individual, but certainly modify their thoughts, emotions, and their actions in ways that are going to be more amenable to the way I want them to think. I want them to emote. I want them to act. So what do we have in our toolkit right now? Well, we have in our toolkit a whole host of assessment technologies, imaging, physiological recording, genomic and genetic assessments, biomarker and proteomic assessments, and a lot of neurodata. And of course, each and all of those assessment approaches are facilitated by big data as a force multiplier. And more and more, those data are coming into the fore when we consider who we should select, how we should train, and ultimately, how we're going to engage our personnel on a variety of different levels to make sure they're performing at peak cognitively, emotionally, behaviorally in their missional spaces. But it's not just a question of gaining the assessment to say, all right, we see how their brain is functioning when they're doing what it is they're doing and how they're doing it well. That's a good step. That's an important step. You want to make a win-win? Don't just understand what it takes to be an effective leader in all of the variety of domains and disciplines that affect viable, optimized, and mission-effective military intelligence operations. What if I could actually tweak it? What if I could use some combination of low-tech means and high-tech means to assess the brains of those who are the best of the best and compare the brains of the best of the best to those who are good, those who are not so good, and those who just quite aren't part of the curve? And if I could shift the slope of that curve to make those who aren't quite so good good, those who are good better, those who are best, best of the best, and keep the best of the best where they are. Well, certainly there are things we could do to be able to facilitate that. We can utilize, for example, a whole host of novel pharmaceuticals, but drugs are dirty. They really are. Even the best of drugs is going to give you something of a buckshot approach. I, mean, I can tell you this from my own experience. I mean, I say that as if I'm using a psychedelic drug user. I can tell you that from my own experience being a neuropharmacologist. We can develop some very specific drugs, but the specificity means they're going to work specifically at places in the brain where that specificity is warranted. Unless we just deliver it low, low volumes of drug, which is possible to keep brain areas, we're always going to get sort of a water of the lawn effect, a buckshot rather than a strop shot effect. But not necessarily. If we link drugs to certain microbiological structures, certain types of what we call phages, certain types of bacteria, we can get very, very low quantities of drug into directed spaces. We can also utilize nanotechnologies, and those nanotechnologies can then create platforms to deliver drugs, utilizing electrical and magnetic current to key areas in the brain. We can also utilize a variety of neurotoxins, some that are organic and some that are inorganic. And again, a host of different technologies that we can use to change brain structures and functions, both external to the skull, as well as indwelling. And increasingly, those indwelling things are moving to less and less and less surgically invasive methods for their implantation. So if we stop for a moment, catch our breath, and put it all together, what we're seeing is that the neurocognitive sciences afford power and capability. Power and capability to affect our own people, to make them better at what they're doing in national security intelligence and defense agendas and missions and operations making leaders more effective, understanding the neurocognitive dynamics of leadership, and then through that understanding of understanding what's going on, literally in the structural functions relations of the brain, targeting that in ways that maximize, personalize, and make precision our selection, our education, our training, and our sustainability for force readiness. 
The flip side of that is if we can make our folks better, can you make their folks, whoever their folks are, not so good, decremented, mitigated, prevented, in some cases, highly compromised? And the answer increasingly is yes. And there are some real worrisome areas here, once again, because please understand, it's not just us who are doing this. The neurosciences are an international, multinational enterprise. And with internationality, multinationality comes multiculturality, which comes multiple values, multiple philosophies, multiple needs, and multiple aims. If we take a look at what's happening on the battle space, once again, a key area that's important to leadership is what we call neural enablement, um, taking our operators and more fighters and utilizing drugs, computational brain machine interfaces, neurosensory augmentation devices to make them better at what it is they're doing, make them better leaders on a variety of, of, of levels from the, the small group, the squad, all the way up to the squadron. And there's a variety of ways we can do that. Essentially here, we're working within military medicine to affect the brain to, quote, mold the mind. And all that the mind does, mind is that source that affects how we perceive, how we orient, how we decide, and how we act. Affecting the brain, if you will, to affect individuals' proverbial OODA loop. Observations, orientations, decisions, and actions. Can we improve OODA loop specificity? Our group over the past few years, and here a deep nod of homage to my colleague, former Captain Rick Bremseth, the United States Navy SEAL, certainly to Diane Deulis and our, our crew over at NDU, and a big thanks here to the United States Air Force, who funded this initial project several years ago, have engaged in what we call neuro-hope, utilizing neurocognitive sciences to maintain our military's personnel's health, operational performance and protection, and enhancing their capability. In other words, working left of bang, where bang is some traumatic or insult of event, perhaps even just going off to battle. It may be a real injury whether that injury is physical or psychological. But what can we do left of bang? What can we do in a proactive way versus a reactive way? And can that also then be classified as some domain of military medicine? The answer to those questions are, yeah, it can be. That's military occupational and preventive medicine. The question then becomes, how much left of bang should we work? And the other issue is, who's doing what internationally left of bang and if what we're doing left of bang is literally making super sailors, super soldiers, and super spooks, do we then need to regard that individual who has been so optimized, who has been so task performancely capabilized as a biological weapon themselves? That's not speculative. There's some really interesting work that's going on in that domain. My, my colleague, Ryan Livoya, has looked at ways that we can capabilize war fighters, trigger pullers very often, and has suggested, might we need to actually look at that individual as a bioweapon, a weaponized individual, particularly when they're then linked to a variety of different computational and or weapon systems. Well, one of the things I'm working with some of my colleagues uh, internationally is moving from theory of how brain works and understanding of how brain works to real tools. This is what we refer to as a neurocognitive test and toolkit system. And as some of you know, I've been talking about the viability of perhaps even employing this on an academic level. Could we run a test flight, if you will, to determine just how viably functional this is empirically in education and training of our future military leaders? Utilizing a training regimen with a variety of task monitors that we yoke to synthetic environments that put them in key demands of leadership skills and knowledge sets utilizing processors and cognitive sensors that are sent back to databases, and then utilizing some of our techniques of neuromodulation, transcranial electrical stimulation, transcranial magnetic stimulation, virgal nerve stimulation, to feed into a processor that then feeds back to that individual to figure out what nodes and networks are working in their brain when they're at peak performance, when they're at medium performance, and when they're subpar, to figure out patterns of neurological node and network activity that are representative of cognitive, emotional, and motoric peak performance that's representative of good leadership. And not just then understanding what's happening and where it's happening in individual brains and groups of brains, but to then use that understanding as a reconnaissance mission to then actually affect the way those nodes and networks are functioning during selection, during training, during performance and sustainability, as the individual acquires more and more missional experience and is exposed to more and more missional stressors, inclusive of new technologies that come into the field of military operation. Essentially, can we keep the curve 
essentially rightwardly shifted with a very, very strong high point left, left slope. So in other words, get people better earlier and keep them better longer. The answer to the question clearly is yes. Some ongoing work that's been done at 7-Eleven Squadron in the United States Air Force, some of the work that's been done by the United States Navy Office of Naval Research, some of the work that's been done at the Marine Warfighter Laboratory has suggested that indeed all of these things are not only possible, but they are probable. And what we're looking to do is to take that to the cutting edge. And there are a variety of other things that we can use the neurosciences for. For example, we can use the neurosciences in military intelligence. We can assess a variety of neuropsychosocial factors that are present in individual and group narratives and expressions in their activities. And we can also utilize that to extract information. We can use patterns of brain imaging and or physiological recording to determine when an individual might be tending towards deception. Now, again, there's some problems with that in courts of law. And here, what we're really dealing with is not only the civilian courts of law, but perhaps international courts of law as well. Here in the United States, there's a particular standard that's used for maximizing certain types of uh, subject matter expertise, both in terms of who is the subject matter expert and how we then utilize the information. This is called the Daubert standard. But the Daubert standard is modified by the nature, the type, the extent, and the reliability of information that's being fed into it. That's a nice way of saying, what does international law ask of the brain sciences, such as the brain sciences can deliver tools and techniques that are then admissible and viable within the scope of international law? And increasingly, we're moving in that direction. So my own work with a brilliant student of mine named Calvin Kraft have really examined that interface. And moreover, some of the work that we've done in our group at Georgetown, that's in the O'Neill Pellegrino Center for Brain Science and Global Law and Health and Policy, have examined what that interface is between what's viable in military and intelligence operations under local and international courts and those ways that the brain sciences might best accommodate that so as to provide a toolkit that is useful in creating cognitive engagement, assessment, perhaps enhancement, and in some cases, even tracking. The question then becomes, if we have the tools, should we use them? What are the ethical issues that arise you know, the legal issues that arise. And what does that then mean for Navy leadership? But more than that, one of the things that becomes important for the leader to recognize is what are the burdens, risks, and threats that are clear and present that will affect not only the conduct of the mission and the force, but also will affect the individuals who are participant. This is why it becomes so important to understand the novelty and the viability of neuroscience as being leveraged as weapons, drugs, bugs, toxins, and devices. I don't have time to go all the way down the rabbit hole on this, but there are plenty. There are enclosed pharmaceuticals and organic toxins can be used at very, very low doses, not as instruments of mass destruction, but rather as instruments and agents of multiple levels of mass disruption from the cellular all the way to the sociopolitical by affecting an individual's conduct who may be a charismatic, social, powerful, a military leader, I essentially affect their conduct with those who are following them. And I can create disruptions that have ripple effects across a range of different levels. I can also utilize things that affect literally biosecurity through microbiological agents. All we need to do is take a look at the past nine months. Let me reinforce what I know. There's nothing that would suggest that SARS-CoV, the agent that causes COVID-19, is an intentionally developed biological weapon. Nothing to suggest that. But who cares? Look what it did. Look at the potency of a microbe let loose on the world stage for which there is no known antidote or treatment that is effective given the resources in place. Why is this problematic? In 2010, we conducted an exercise with NATO in, in Moldova. It was part of the, the NATO Science for Peace exercise that was run by my colleague Ashok Vashasta, Dr. Ashok Vashasta, then at the Department of State. And one of the things we look to do is to model the viability of utilizing cutting edge neuroscience and technology in one area we're looking at is toxins, drugs, and perhaps microbes. Could we create some micro based upon something that's already out there, or perhaps create something brand new that mimics neurological and psychiatric effects and in so doing has a tremendous morbidity impact? For example, if I let it loose in a fleet, if I let it loose in a deployed squadron, if I let it loose on a MU or a MEF, and then suddenly all of these individuals are taking sick. 
I need not necessarily kill them. I don't even want to kill them. I want to make them sick. So what I'm then doing is I'm maximizing the resources necessary to keep them healthy, return them to health, to care for them. I'm draining resources from various places and thereby hobbling the force efficiency on the whole. Well, you know, another little exercise we did in 2010, we were able to hobble the U.S. public health system in about 43 days. 43 days. If you take a look at what SARS-CoV and what COVID has done, there's a mirror there. By the, thing, by the time the thing hit our shores in March, by April, it was running rampant, such that our public health system couldn't really handle it. What does it tell you about biosecurity? And although there are certainly identified agents, microbes, viruses, that will attack the nervous system and cause a variety of neurological and psychiatric effects, many of them morbid, some of them mortal, the real threat here is the facility by which existing agents that are relatively benign can be modified using newly available gene editing techniques. And if we keep going on the range of technology that's available to us, we then have the use of nanoparticulate agents, aerosolizable nanomaterials that can be breathed in and disrupt blood flow or neurological network activity that can be used as an in-close weapon or perhaps that can be used as a, a more broad weapon of disruption and or destruction. We also have the capability to utilize nanomaterials to get electrodes into a head and to create a vast array of viable sensors and transmitters. That's currently on the drawing board for developmental tech readiness level within five years. This is DARPA's N-cubed program, next generation, non-invasive neuromodulation, utilizing these techniques and technologies to create vast arrays of implantable electrodes that need not be put into the brain surgically that are then able to read from the brain and write into the brain remotely in real time. And we are not alone in our pursuits of this. Clearly, there are a whole host of other things that can be weaponized. I'll just touch upon the fact that various forms of directed energy are capable of having effects upon the brain. And certainly, we've already talked about data and the vulnerability that big data then renders, as well as its capability to, in fact, engage in neuroscience. Many of these things can also be used non-kinetically. For example, we can get proximate effects, intermediate effects, and distal effects for strategically latent disruptive effects where I can use data to create precision pathologies and to just affect individuals' reality. In other words, if I mess with your data, particularly your neuropsych data, I can really mess with the way people regard you and treat you on a whole host of levels, from the interpersonal all the way to the professional, from the social all the way to security clearances. And why is this so important? Because neuro is easy to get. A lot of the stuff we can get right off the shelf. There are also indeed dedicated efforts by a number of countries worldwide, inclusive of our transatlantic and trans-Pacific peer competitors. And there are independent actors who are working as proxies and or who are working as agents themselves to be able to utilize do-it-yourself forms of neuroscience within certain sovereignties that can affect military and intelligence operations domestically. I've given you a host of these applications. And interestingly, one of the things that we've noted is that the lack of commitment to engage in understanding of neuroscience and technology in these ways by one group can very often create an opportunistic window for others. And in some cases, failure to commit on my part may augment your capability on others. And it's difficulty in terms of being able to guard against these things because it is a global event. Surveillance is needed, oversight is needed, but certainly preparedness is needed. How global is it? I don't want to get into the, the specifics of what's called the neurobioeconomy. I hear a, a, a deep nod again of homage to Joe DeFranco, who's working with our group, and Dr. Maureen Riemann. We just have a paper come out in the journal Health Security that looks at neurobioeconomy, neurobiosecurity. And one of the issues here, as we said earlier, is the economics of it. But more than the economics, it's product, it's method, and it's tool infiltration on a variety of levels the public to the populational, from the individual all the way to the military. Integrating these products and integrating their control produces particular vulnerabilities and susceptibilities. But more than that, if we just take a look at who's doing this stuff worldwide and what their committed efforts are right now in 2020, we can see that peer competitors, cum potential adversaries, are getting a leg up in this area. And the use of the neurocognitive sciences to facilitate the performance and leaderships of one's own military and intelligence personnel can also be leveraged in those ways that are going to decrement the capabilities, performance, and therefore power of others. So in sum, what I'm going to tell you is that neuroscience and technology and national security intelligence defense operations certainly affords the ability to win 
minds, and hearts, to affect minds, to win over hearts, and dictate human emotion, thoughts, and behaviors in those ways that can maximize the performance of our own, and in those ways that can minimize, degrade, and in some cases actually negate the performance and capabilities of others. What we can do here is provocative. What we should do with it remains at issue and is somewhat contentious. My argument is that right now in 2020, we've already entered into a neuroscientific and neurotechnological speedway. It's an international speedway, multiple lanes, many countries, multiple vehicles, multiple techniques and technologies that are being used within military intelligence operations to facilitate leadership, as well as to facilitate real word followship. And there is a rapid pace. The prizes are big economically in terms of power as well, but there are risks and hazards. Yeah, there are conventions that are out there, but the question that arises, are these conventions not just necessary, but are they sufficient? Some of the work with my colleague, Dr. Dan Gerstein, as well as my colleague, Dr. Diane Deulis, in examining the fine print of these international signatory treaties has suggested that no, they're not. They're really not keeping their finger on the pulse of the rapid development of brain sciences, not only within the United States and its allied nations, but internationally and sometimes in programs that utilize commercial veiling to be able to then hide behind in terms of what's being made available to make their military intelligence personnel better and to develop a whole arsenal of weapons, both kinetically and non-kinetically, that can then decrement the performance of competitors and adversaries. It's not to say there aren't ethical legal issues. There are. Some are technologically focal, some are derivative as we then let this thing loose into the social milieu, not only just within the military, but also given the fact that we're in an open society and there needs to be some transparency to the public. Our group has developed something called OnRamp, an operational neurotechnology risk assessment and mitigation paradigm. Four steps, evaluate the science and capabilities, evaluate the parameters of its use, assess benefit, risk, and harm parameters, and then frame within context of applications. That sounds pretty good, but it has to establish particular contingencies. What is the technical rightness of utilizing any neuroscience and tech in military intelligence operations? How do we balance transparency and secrecy? How do we evaluate and revise ethical concepts to guide its use? And obviously we have to be focal here. We're talking about situational use within the military. Therefore, military ethics certainly applies. But there are also boundary issues given the fact that the United States is an open society and there is levels of transparency in public communication in that the military serves politics, it serves the polis. But more than that, that military must remain prepared and ready. So an understanding of what's going on with our competitors come adversaries on the global stage is essential for Navy leadership, military leadership in these domains, in these dimensions. Whatever ethics we use must be relevant to the goals and values of the community at use. In this case, it's the military. It has to ask what ends, what are the means? And clearly the contextuality of this is to those operations in which we're going to employ it. We've asked some key questions. Is there greater or lesser harm by using these techniques? Are there certain circumstances that would prompt or, or mitigate its use? What are the limits? How do we determine those limits? How can said limits be enforced? There have been a number of possible responses to the use of the brain sciences and national security intelligence and defense, whether it's for leadership, whether it's trigger pulling, airplane flying, or whether it's to alter the behaviors of competitors and adversaries. One is a frank restriction. And good enough in theory, I mean, realistically, we should use science and technology for peace. But what about the idea of use contra bellum? In other words, justification for use to prevent war. What does that entail? That, that's a tricky one. I don't have the time to go down that rabbit hole here, but very often that is a justifying response. It's also very difficult to create universal bans based upon many of the cultural, philosophical, commercial, and political variances that occur on the global stage. So what we find is that we have to then engage some social impact of what use or misuse of this science might be within the military, engage some level of deliberation within the military and say, yes, we're going to use these things in these ways, and then also have some transparency to the public and also maintain some level of commitment. But we also have to be contextually precise. We need to remain prepared. Yeah, there are going to be risks. There may be burdens, but that need not stifle the quest for novel and improved tools and methods to be able to facilitate and optimize the performance of our leaders, our individuals, our military personnel, and to be sensitive to the fact that there are competitors, come adversaries, who may be looking to do not only the same, but may be looking to decrement and in some cases negate what we are capable of doing. To do this effectively, 
we have required for thrust strategy, emerging technologies and threats for thrust strategy. Here again, a deep nod to my colleague, Captain Rick Bremseth. This four thrusts are interrelated, increase awareness as to what's going out there. It was one of the recommendations of our Cyborg Soldier 2050 report. Quantify the actual threat. What's real, what isn't? What's ready to go? What's on a lower tech readiness level? How can we counter that threat or meet that threat? And ultimately, how can we gain tactical and strategic advantage? And clearly what we're saying is that whole of government is not enough. As we've seen evidence in the COVID crisis, it's not just enough to have a coordinated government response. And we can see what happens when we lack that. To be able to manifest preparedness within military intelligence operations for the rising tide of neurocognitive sciences and technologies that are able to facilitate effective naval and military and intelligence leadership and followership as well as to be able to in some ways affect and militate the conduct of adversaries and competitors, it's going to take a whole of nation approach. In sum, what I'm here to tell you is that right now, as we approach 2021, as a neurocognitive scientist who's been functionally working in the field for the past four decades, I can tell you that neuroscience and neurotechnology are not only under consideration, they are contextually being applied in a variety of national intelligence, security, and defense agendas worldwide. Clearly, there's an interface there with this field called neuroethics. How do we fight for right and freedom utilizing these tools and technologies and at the same time keep our honor clean? But what does that also mean with regard to our stance for preparedness as we increasingly have the demand for leadership when encountering adversaries and competitors who are using their techniques to their advantage and our disadvantage? With great knowledge comes great capability. With great capability comes great power. And with great power comes great responsibility. Hey, look, Goethe said it, Aristotle said it, and Spider-Man said it, good enough for me. But as we take a path forward, we have to take a look at the double-edged blade that we have. What do we do? What should we not do? How do we use the neurocognitive sciences to make our people optimized in their leadership and their followership, to increase our force capability and readiness? And if nothing else, how to remain prepared and responsive for the fact that the brain sciences are being used in these initiatives worldwide, by our competitors, by our adversaries. So I'll leave you with a word of wisdom that my father told me almost 60 years ago. When I was a little kid, my dad and I used to build stuff together. He was an engineer, he was a nautical engineer, he worked for American Electric Boat for a long time, designed submarines. And he liked to fiddle with things, build things, repair things, and I still like to do that. And my dad was a good teacher, he taught me a lot about tools. In fact, every Tuesday, first Tuesday of the month was New Tool Tuesday, and I'd get a new tool and we'd spend a month working with it. So you could imagine that by the time I got to be 10 years old, my dad started this when I was around five or six, I got to have a pretty good utility belt, so to speak. And I thought I knew what I was doing with all the impulsiveness of a 10-year-old kid. Well, you know, neuroscience and neurotechnology, that's a relatively new field. And there's a relative impulsiveness that goes along with that. And I remember one day my dad came home, it was New Tool Tuesday, and he brought me a new tool. I was really excited. I remember I grabbed that thing and I went to go run downstairs to our workbench to put it to use. My dad put his hand on my shoulder and said, Jim, Measure twice, cut once. Sometimes there's no turning back. Use those tools wisely, my son. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, let's use these tools. Let's use them wisely. Let's be wise about the way they're being used. Let's chart a path forward and navigate that path with prudent and pragmatic leadership, utilizing these tools to facilitate our leadership and utilizing our leaders to facilitate our preparedness and readiness for the use of these tools. If you're interested in some of the stuff we've done over the past years, here's some of our readings that we provide for you. They're available. Simply shoot me an email. Some additional information about some of the things I've talked about. A host of SMA Pentagon white papers here once again with a deep nod of homage to Dr. Kabayan, my colleague Diane Dulis, Bill Casebeer, Jason Spitaletter, Nick Wright. And here comes the unabashed self-promotional plug. If you're interested in taking a deeper dive as to how brain science is utilized in national security and defense, I recommend this to you, not because I want to go out and buy a new Mercedes Benz if you buy the book, but because I'm proud of it. I didn't write it, although I have contributory chapters. It was a bit like herding cats. We brought some of the best minds internationally in philosophy, ethics, policy, science, military, intelligence to provide their view, their voice through this lens of how brain science can and perhaps should be used in these initiatives, agendas, and operations, and I recommend it to you highly. If you want to get in touch with me, this is how you can reach me. You can reach me via my email. That's james.giordano at georgetown.edu. Once again, james.giordano at georgetown.edu. Order right now and get a free brain optimization performance kit 
for your very own. No, that's not true. But if you want to get in touch with me, that's the way we can do it. And I certainly have some time for your questions. And thank you so very, very much for your time and attention. Well, Professor Giordano, thanks. Uh, thanks very much for your time here today. Your presentation was, uh, I thought, fascinating, enlightening, and a little chilling at, uh, at times as well. Um, these insights into what clearly is going to be um, a very important part of military affairs, I think, is very much appreciated here at an institution that's, uh, that aims to create future warfighters for our nation in the generation ahead. So we have uh, approximately 15 minutes or so for question and answer. We ask that you uh, write it down and forward it in the chat function. I'll then acknowledge you to, uh, to ask the question directly so uh, we can record it and have Professor Giordano's uh, answers. So uh, Dr. Sean Baker from the Stockdale Center, if you're still on, please, would you pose your question? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks. I'm hearing echo there. James, fascinating uh, uh, presentation. As I was listening to it, it made me think, I don't know why it popped into my head, but uh, there's a parasite that lives in the gut of cats. Yes. Called uh, Toxoplasm. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, the interesting thing about it is it has a very specific neurological effect on mice and makes them yes. unafraid of the cats. So a uh, nightmare scenario came to mind for me is uh, adversaries with less moral scruples than perhaps we have. Uh, wh what do you think is the uh, likelihood that uh, they are working on things like that to uh, in inflict upon us uh, as as weapons? Uh, relatively high uh, in terms of the specificity and the advancement of such projects. I think there have been certain things, for example, in gene editing tools and other molecular biological tools that have sort of pumped up the volume on the pace. I also think that what tends to happen as we gain a better understanding of the mechanism, how something like toxoplasmosis or toxoplasma in the gut of a cat can then in fact affect its prey, so to speak, and what, what influences they might have. In other words, what is that inter set of interactions mechanistically? And can that then be harnessed, if not adapted in certain ways to create agents that might be viable in humans? The answer there is yes. As you saw yeah. in the part that I was talking about, the idea of, of designer or precision pathogens, that's just what I was talking about. In other words, yeah. if, if I sort of know what makes you tick, can I then develop something that's going to affect your ticking and talking in such a way that's going to make it more amenable to my will, my intent, my outcomes? Over. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Dr. Joe Thomas, uh, director of the Stockdale Center. And I'd like to also extend my thanks, Dr. Giordano. Uh, terrific uh, presentation, a really nice compliment to the types of things we've gotten before and I think are going to get in the future from the Neuro Leadership Institute, which is a non-military application, no context of uh, the military applications of any of that. So uh, this was really, uh, you know, fills a nice uh, void in the types of things we've been looking at before. I'm particularly interested in uh, one of your slides had mentioned a neurocognitive test and toolkit system. And, and I thought you mentioned that it was being worked at at, at DARPA. Um, uh, so, that, let me just let me just interject. That is not being worked at DARPA. Um, ah. Again, there's, there's a bit of the proprietor here, and I don't want to advocate um, a particular group that I'm working with. But that actually is our research group working with our colleagues at Neurogen. And that is something that we're looking to pilot. We've done some of the initial pilot work whereby it's this proof of concept and proof of principle and result. And now we're looking to engage that in a variety of circumstances, training, education, situational involvement with a variety of forces, special operations forces. And there's been some real interest in early stage education of naval leaders. If that's something you'd be interested in, we can certainly talk offline, sir. I would love to hear more about that, actually. Yeah, it's the, it's the type of things uh, that seems like it has direct application to some of the work we've been at least interested in and touching on. Uh, and yes, sir, and that, is, that is fully ready to go. I know you have a, something of a physiology and or behavioral test platform availability at the academy. Um, and that is something that is literally ready to go. That's ready right out of the box. And we can get the gears rolling on that as soon as we run it through. I guess your your intramural uh, review board, your IRB, get that cleared. Uh, the procedures and protocols are rather straightforward. And what we find is deliverables that are available every six calendar months based upon the progress of the work. So I'd be happy to talk to you about that. Great. Yeah, I'd love to learn more. Thanks. Yes, sir. 
Professor, if I might ask a, a question to you, it, it regards the uh, ethical framework and the development of, of uh, ethical thought on warfare and the neurocognitive uh, domain. Uh, and I, I've noted that you're working on, on several ethics panels here that go along with your work in the, in the defense uh, establishment. Have, has, the, has the literature within ethics in this developed to the point where we, we have uh, bumpers on either side as to what clearly is out of ethical bounds and what is in? And could you maybe flesh out that discussion a little bit more? Sure. I mean, sure. I'd, I'd be happy to actually come back and really take a deep dive in the ethics because it, it warrants a considerable amount of, of flap jaw. Um, the first, there are two things that must be born in, into, into mind. Number one, the ethics has to be about the effort of the enterprise. In other words, if what we're talking about here is the use of any science and technology or the articulation of any acts, it has to be specific and germane to the effort in which those acts are then in, entailed. This is military. This is intelligence. We can't talk about business ethics. Yeah, we can engage medical ethics because there's a biomedical and scientific component to this, but the application, the context of use is critical. In 2013, 2014, uh, when we stood up the Neuroethical Legal Social Issues Advisory Panel at DARPA through the, through the strong advocacy, again, of, of one of the principal program managers, Bill Casebeer, it became apparent that what DARPA was actually looking for is some ethical guidance in this realm. Working in concert with the American Medical Association, what we tried to do is to create something of a paradigm, what we call six R's. In other words, you have to go through this checklist of things that begin with an R, responsibility for realistic assessment, et cetera, et cetera that then should be framed within six W questions. What, where, when, who, that then have to be contextualized within what we call six Cs, which are things like the actual capabilities, consequences, character, continuity of clinical research and care that ultimately lead to the contingencies for consent. And more recently, we framed that in policy formulations that we call the six Ps. So this provides that on-ramp, that operational neuroscience mm -hmm. Uh, uh, risk assessment and mitigation paradigm. But the question still is, what ethical system do you use? And there are many. We advocate a structural functional approach where a structural deontology, in other words, a dutiful ethics that is applicable within the military, provides a structure of the basic parameters of pre and proscription. And then you must use a, 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 a an engagement, a progression to what's called rule utilitarianism. What are the rules? And here the rules need to appreciate not only what's intranational, but international in terms of rules of conduct engagement, what represents just war, what represents just conduct within war, and the lesser Augustinian maxim of what represents justifiable activities to prevent war, that then gets translated over into act utility. That act utility then needs to be fed through a communitarian ethic, whereby what you're doing to the individual has to be good for the force. What is good for the force preserves the individual. And then ultimately, you get down to the command and control level, which engages some set of agentic or virtue ethics. So we actually have a structural functional format for this that I'd be happy to engage with you uh, in more detail, because as you can see, it, it's, not, it's not straightforward. But the other issue is not just about the contextuality of the effort, but if what ethics is about is if you're doing good, Who's good? What rationality? This is the question that's been raised by the philosopher Alistair McIntyre. So in other words, what we define to be good, whoever we may be working within the parameters that we have for defining these things, might not be a universal. And there might be variances and diversities in subjective and objective characteristics of good that are not only definable, that are wholly acceptable within a particular culture and society that then dictate conduct that may be very, very different from what we're going to do. And being aware of those ethical diversities, philosophical diversities, and the various advantages or disadvantages they can they confer, and how to then be prepared for that, not only at the ethical bargaining table, in terms of how ethics should then inform policy and perhaps international law, but on a very practical level, in terms of what things might pop up as you're playing both ethical, scientific, or technical whack-a-mole with your adversaries and competitors, that's a deeper discussion. Happy to come back and talk to you about that either offline or online on a forum like this, but um, it, that, that's a work in progress. And there are certainly some things that we've done, and, and I can provide those papers to you if you'd like, that have tried to explore what those ethical parameters may be and some of the difficulties. Over. Well, we look forward to, to that uh, subsequent discussion here. Okay. Uh, Brian Aiken has a question. Brian, over to you. Hi. Um, 
I'm Lieutenant Brianne Aiken, one of the officers working at the Sailing Center at the United States Naval Academy. My question is, uh, because I've seen it and we've all seen it with other developmental tools that have been released, that there are repercussions on our sailors psychologically and physically in regards to their health. So I'm wondering, as we're developing new neurobiological tools, uh, to what extent are psychologists or therapists involved in that process so that when we release those tools, we're already prepared as leaders or support personnel to kind of anticipate those struggles that they're going to go through and make it a smooth transition? Excellent question. Um, there, there needs to be a larger level of what I'll, what I'll call community engagement. Um, again, in my background, aerospace physiology, phys, um, research physiology and psychology. I don't think those things are, are separable. I don't think those things are in any way extricable. I mean, we're doing to sort of maximize physiological and cognitive performance in certain aspects. And what we need to be aware of is what our people may face with regard to not only optimized competitors and adversaries, but what they may face in terms of decrements of their own performance in the battlescape need to be dealt with in a way that is biopsychosocial. And what I mean by social is social within the context of not only the military, but status post-military within the VA, within civil society. One of the things we were very aware of is something that our group referred to as PEDS, post-enhancement distress syndrome. I mean, if we take our people and we make them Superman and Superwoman, what happens when they go back to being Clark Kent and Lois Lane? And or we really don't have the longitudinality of understanding the effects of these things on individuals who are in these environments for 30 or 40 years. And we're doing this to fairly young people. So what are the obligate responsibilities to care for those individuals and continue research to be able to understand it? Not only when they're in, when they're still in uniform, but when they're out. And then what does that then bespeak with regard to the continuity of services that are engaged between the military and the VA and the military and the VA and, and the society writ large? And I can tell you right now that based upon some of the work that I've done with my colleague, Professor John Shook, in many ways, civic institutions are not prepared for that. And that's a discourse that needs to happen. Your point is stellar. I'd be happy to help you with that if you'd like, ma'am. Professor, thanks very much. We have uh, uh, this final question here. Uh, this uh, Naval Academy here is an undergraduate uh, institution. Uh, based upon what you said today about this uh, looming importance of uh, relatively new uh, domain of warfare, how might we here in Annapolis better prepare our future military officers for engaging and succeeding in this uh, new battle space? I mean, that's, that's a fairly easy question, actually. I think like anything else, we're talking about science, technology, and engineering. And so making our future leaders, making our military officers, whether they be Navy, whether they be Army, whether they be Air Force, Marine Corps, aware of those technologies that are out there and their various applications and capabilities, both in the proximate as well as intermediate term that's going to define their career, becomes important. The first step of, of, of any one of these multiple thrust approaches for readiness and preparedness is awareness. I can guarantee you, I could pretty much walk up and down the hall at Annapolis, same way as I do with Naval War College, and say, hey, what do you know about neuroweapons and neuroperformance enhancement? And I get a look that I get when I talk to my dog and say, do you want a cracker? <laughs> so it's just not out there. Or what's ending up happening is it's surrounded by a lot of either hype or dystopian ideation. Both of that is wrong. We need to cut through this. Any analysis begins from fact. What can we really do? And what I mean by we, we is humanity. What can be done in science and technology that can then be translatable into these environments, perhaps on our sides of the pond and perhaps on, quote, their sides of the pond? And what will that then infer and what are the implications for effective military intelligence leadership during the scope of these undergraduates military career, whether that's short term or long term? So making them aware that the fact that the science and technology is out there and that certainly it has viable benefits to those to whom it is rendered for performance optimization, health, readiness, capabilization, but also that it carries some burdens in those regards, and in some cases, risks, threats, and harms when leveraged as potential weapons, or when we get an, a group of individuals who have been so enhanced, creates the realities of the future battlescape that our military leaders must deal with. So I think awareness is a first step, quantification is a second step, and that can be done through curricular infusion making them aware that these things are out there and part of the real toolkit for national security intelligence, intelligence and defense agendas is just as important as teaching them about a new torpedo, a new submarine, a new aircraft, or some form of cyber. Over. 
Well, Professor, thanks. Uh, thanks very much. We could we could spend the entire day on this, but unfortunately, our time has come to an end. Uh, Professor James Giordano from Georgetown University and his uh, talk today, Battlescape Brain, Leading and Leadership in Preparedness and Use of Neurocognitive Science and in uh, Military and Intelligence Operations. We look forward to continuing this uh, conversation uh, in the months and years ahead. We hope that you'll be part of it, uh, Professor Giordano. And the Stockdale Center will uh, pledge to continue to offer further uh, topics in this broad subject of brain science and effective leadership. So to everyone who, uh, who tuned in, we hope that you'll continue to engage in this discussion with the Stockdale Center for Ethical Leadership from, uh, from Annapolis, Maryland and Luce Hall, the Stockdale Center for Ethical Leadership. We thank you and we'll see you next time. Thank you.